All right, everybody, welcome back to Introduction to U.S. Multicultural Literatures. Today we are going to begin our discussion, which will last for two lectures, of Philip Roth's novel of 1979, The Ghost Writer. Um, I'm going to begin by giving you some background and some contexts on Roth's life, um, his literary career, and some of the backgrounds to the ghost writer which is among other things an autobiographical uh, novel a more or less explicitly autobiographical novel uh, because philip roth unlike the other two novelists we read was a celebrity a celebrity novelist and even in some ways just a, a sort of celebrity a subject of uh, you know celebrity gossip and things like that throughout his life and so we need to understand the ways in which that affected his work, the way in which he traded on that celebrity in his work by almost teasing readers with uh, autobiographical qualities in his work that they would have understood because his life was something that was reported about. Philip Roth is, um, well, let me just get into it. So I'll get into Philip Roth's biography and some of his uh, some of his background, and then we will begin talking about the text. I plan in this lecture to cover the first part of the text, the chapter one, Maestro, and then I will cover the subsequent chapters, particularly two and three. Chapter four is really more of a kind of an epilogue, but I think a lot of the main uh, thematic weight of the book hinges on chapters two and three. So I will focus on those in the next lecture. I will begin, uh, I will prepare for those by talking about the context for the novel and the first chapter in today's. So Philip Roth lived from 1933 to 2018. He was born in Newark, New Jersey, to first-generation Jewish-American parents. As I mentioned, he and Amiri Baraka were both uh, from Newark and very famous literary citizens of Newark. And I put them back-to-back -back in this course, you know, for a reason, because I think they're probably the two most controversial uh, writers we'll study in this class in many ways. Um, and he studied at Bucknell and the University of Chicago, he served two years in the U.S. Army, but that was during um, the late or the mid to late 50s, which was not a period of combat. So he didn't see combat, but he did serve in the Army. And then I think a back injury uh, let, you know, led him to leave the Army. And he taught creative writing and literature until 1991. So Roth uh, is part of that movement that we already saw with Richard E. Kim. And I, I believe that Kim had was um i believe that kim was a student of roth's at a certain point so there's a little bit of continuity in the authors we're reading roth is part of that movement across the 20th century we noted of the academicization and professionalization of creative writing the idea that creative writing would be a university degree and then a graduate degree and it was a, a course of study you could pursue and then that led to its own sort of networks being formed. So you would go through these networks to get, you know, publishing contracts and things like that. So the professionalization, the credentialization of creative writing, you need a degree to do it. That's something that's pretty new. You didn't, you know, that wasn't something that, had, that was occurring even in the early 20th century. You know, none of the authors we read whether Gertrude Stein or Ezra Pound or Langston Hughes or Nella Larson had anything that looked like a degree in creative writing because it wasn't even something that really existed until, um, I don't know, I don't want to be too categorical because I could be proven wrong with a single example, but it wasn't something that was common at all until the middle of the 20th century and then it became an exceedingly common and Roth was part of that kind of network. Um, of teaching. I think his degrees were in English or comparative literature, but then he became a teacher of creative writing. So he had two marriages. One, the first one, apparently, uh, well, no, both of them were disastrous, I think, um, but uh, each in different ways. Uh, and you can read his second wife, the famous English actress Claire Bloom's book about being married to Philip Roth. Um, it doesn't sound like it was a great, uh, great thing to be married to Philip Roth. We'll talk about that, though. I don't want to I don't want to slander the man either. There are probably countervailing tales as well um and he he had so let's talk about his literary career not his personal life and then we'll get into his uh what that has to do with what's being portrayed in the ghostwriter so roth enters the literary scene with a book called goodbye columbus in 1959 which was a novella a short little novel and a collection of short stories and this was a big success 
Um, what's happening in the literary scene in the middle of the 20th century is you have a kind of first diversification of American literature um, in, as far as the mainstream goes. So we, we were looking with modernism at the diversification of, of American literature happening in kind of avant-garde movements with writers of the Harlem Renaissance and you know Parisian expatriates. But the mainstream really starts to become more I would say ethnically, racially, racially, and religiously diverse in the middle of the 20th century after World War II. And the success of Richard E. Kim's The Martyred it, that we already talked about is part of that. I think Roth uh, emerging on the scene is another part of that because you have an unprecedented rise to prominence of African-American writers like Ralph Ellison, Richard Wright, James Baldwin, of Jewish American writers like Saul Bellow, Philip Roth, Norman Mailer, and of uh, Catholic writers like, for instance, Flannery O'Connor in the South, um, because the American literary scene up until then had been very much dominated by white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you know, often spoken of as wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And you have the emergence of writers who, whether racially, ethnically, religiously, or a combination thereof, are outside of that wasp mainstream. And Roth's success, his early success in 1959, which if you check the dates, he's a very young writer at this point, he's in his 20s, is I think part of that diversification. So Goodbye Columbus was a controversial book for reasons I will get into, having to do with its portrayal of the Jewish American community. Other Jewish Americans uh, criticized Roth for his portrayal of the Jewish American community, particularly in the short story. So the title novella, Goodbye Columbus, is about um, a love affair between a younger uh, uh, Jewish guy from kind of the working class and an older, no, no she wasn't older, but I, I mean a wealthier uh, woman of the upper middle class of the Jewish community. And it's about these kind of interclass tensions and the way they play themselves out in this romance. And that wasn't the particularly controversial thing. It was a couple of the short stories that were in the book. And we'll talk about that. And then after Goodbye Columbus, he wrote a few other books that weren't um, very, uh, I don't know, that haven't really been considered some of his best books. And then in 1969, he publishes a book called Portnoy's Complaint. And if Goodbye Columbus was, you know, well received, but also kind of controversial, this took that into the stratosphere, this book Portnoy's Complaint. And I'm going to discuss Portnoy's Complaint in some detail on the next slide. Uh, and so, fair warning, uh, just as with the last lecture where I put up Baraka's poem, Black Art, and I didn't necessarily read every word of that poem, I'm going to put up a, an image of Portnoy's complaint and an image of some of selections from the text so you can get a flavor of why it was so controversial. I will not read aloud these excerpts from the text. I don't want to be uh, saying these things in an educational context on video necessarily, but I do think you need to know what's in the book. Um, so I've put it on the slide uh, and I'm going to talk about why he wrote that way and what came of it, what, what that occasioned, what the response was, because I think you need that background to understand why 10 years after Portnoy's complaint, he does the ghostwriter. And then he has a subsequent career after that, which I'll talk about in a moment. So I'm gonna go off of this slide onto the next one for a minute, and then I'm gonna come back to this slide. And I'm gonna explain what Barack Obama is doing there too. Um, so, uh, so fair warning, next slide is uh, dirty. So here we go, Portnoy's Complaint, a novel of 1969 by Philip Roth. So Portnoy's Complaint is part of a broader moment in American or even Western fiction when in the 1950s there had been a series of obscenity trials, a trials of books being put on trial because they were thought to be obscene. Uh, because there were active obscenity laws in America and other countries that said you couldn't publish certain works uh, that dealt in a frank way, particularly with sexual topics, because that was obscenity, and obscenity was against the law. And so you have books, uh, I mean, it starts in the moment of modernism with James Joyce's famous novel Ulysses, um, which is banned 
in America. It's published in 1922 in Europe, but it's banned in America until 1934 when a judge lifts the restriction. But you have other famous books uh, such as the English writer D.H. Lawrence's novel Lady Chatterley's Lover. You have what we mentioned last week, uh, last lecture, which was Allen Ginsberg's poem How from the beat literature movement. Another beat literature figure was William S. Burroughs, uh, and he has a novel called Naked Lunch. There was another American novel. I've actually never read this one, Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer. I started reading it, but if there was anything in it other than obscenity, I couldn't detect it, so I never finished it. Uh, I did read the other books I've mentioned. So all of these books, Ulysses, Lady Chatterley's Lover, Naked Lunch, Howl, Tropic of Cancer, they're all being put on trial for obscenity in the middle of the 20th century. And in pretty much every case, this is happening both in the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, in every case, the books went because expert witnesses who are literary critics are being called to testify. And they're usually saying, even if you want to ban pornography, these books aren't pornography because they have a serious literary merit and some serious political, moral, um, ethical content. So you can't ban these books. And also there's a broader, you know, social thing when you're, especially when you're coming out of the 1950s, we talked about the 1950s being that moment where kind of family values and very traditional gender roles were reasserted after World War II, but that only lasted about a decade. And then you have the beginnings of the sexual revolution of the 1960s. So a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the, basis of prosecuting literature for obscenity seemed to belong to a social order that was fading. There was a famous moment in the trial of the British novel Lady Chatterley's Lover that took place in England where the prosecutor said to one of the witnesses on the, uh, on the stand who was defending the book for obscenity, he said something like, would you let your female servant read this book? And so, and that suggested that the whole case for prosecuting obscenity came out of this old social order, this old class structure, this old sense of gender roles that were just fading by the time you're entering the second half of the 20th century. So the point, the point I'm making is that by the 60s, uh, uh, restrictions on what could be written in fiction and what could be published even in mainstream fiction had collapsed. And that was true not just in fiction, but in popular music with the emergence of um, Elvis Presley, the Beatles, early rock and roll. They were considered, I mean, it probably looks tame by today's standards, but you know, the way Elvis danced by moving his hips was considered extraordinarily sexual. And how could you put that on TV? Um, and you know some of the songs the Beatles sang. Like I said, if you were to go back and watch watch it now, you know it would seem very um, uh, quaint compared to compared to to what we have now. But then it was considered shocking. And so I just put some lines on the slide from a po from a uh, some famous lines from a poem by a British poet named Philip Larkin, and he has a poem called Annus Mirabilis, uh, which translates from Latin the Year of Miracles. And he's referring to the year 1963. And people, when they talk about the sexual revolution, they often quote these lines. He says, sexual intercourse began in 1963, which was rather late for me, between the end of the Chatterley ban and the Beatles' first LP. So LP, because you're very young people, is a record, a long playing record. That was how music was once played, uh, <laughs> in case you didn't know. So what he's saying is between the end of the ban on the novel Lady Chatterley's Lover for Obscenity, between the lifting of that prohibition and the first record of the Beatles, that's when sexual intercourse began, in other words. Of course, he's exaggerating, but what he means is this is when you could talk about sex in society. So there's a whole range of novels being published in the late 60s, early 70s in the literary mainstream that are extraordinarily sexually frank and would have been banned as obscene a generation before. And now they're, they're published, but they're still controversial because this was a new thing. 
And one of these books is Portnoy's Complaint by Philip Roth. Uh, as you can see, I have an image of, uh, this is an actual photo I took of a, the paperback copy I own of this book, which was, <laughs> which was given to me by my father when I was a teenager. Um, and so, you know, because it was a notorious book and, you know, it was, uh, well, you know, whatever. I still own this book. It's the paperback from the early 70s that my dad bought when he was a teenager because it was like a scandalous, dirty book that like people wanted to read to see what the scandal was. So, uh, so what's the book about? Well, it is about a young um, Jewish American boys coming of sexual age and dealing with the conflict between his growing sexuality and what he felt was the weight of moral prohibition coming from his Jewish American parents who were uh, who were the children of immigrants and who were upwardly mobile and who wanted to strive and succeed in society um, and therefore wanted their kid, their son, Alexander Portnoy, to lead a respectable middle-class life. And yet he's constantly finding that this desire his parents have for respectability is conflicting with his libidinous desiring urges, which are detailed in you know, passages that uh, you can see on the slide. Now, the title, Portnoy's Complaint, so the, the whole book is, I promise you this is relevant to the ghostwriter, by the way, but I'm getting to it. The whole uh, th uh, basis of the book is it's narrated in the first person by Portnoy as he's explaining this problem to his psychologist, to his psychoanalyst. He's explaining the problems he's had in his life. So it's this monologue coming from the from a you know psychologist session and so the title portnoy's complaint it's both his complaining about his his sort of almost it's it's very self-deprecating his sort of um, just almost whining about his life but also his complaint in the medical sense what is his illness and the psychologist decides the you know portnoy's complaint this illness is a disorder in which strongly felt ethical and altruistic impulses are perpetually warring with extreme sexual longings, often of a perverse nature. So this problem between wanting to do the right thing and also wanting all of these things that are considered base, degraded. And I, this is, I think if you read The Ghostwriter, even the first half, you'll see that that's a conflict in the ghostwriter. And what's interesting about the ghostwriter is it's not simply or even mainly sexual in the ghostwriter. I think Roth is famous, notorious in some quarters for the way he writes about sex, but he also writes about a lot of other stuff. And in the ghostwriter, it's about, it's about that other stuff. And we're gonna have to talk about what that other stuff is, but I wanna introduce that theme of a conflict between strongly felt ethical and altruistic, which means wanting to help others, uh, impulses are perpetually warring with extreme, let's say, base longings, whether that's for sex, for fame, for money, for power. That's uh, an issue in Roth's work. But I want to be clear. I So I also excerpted on this slide... Um, the review from the Washington Post, which is a you know famous mainstream newspaper back then and today, and the review that's quoted on the you know inside of the book, the reviewer said the most important book of my generation. I have never in my experience heard a book so generally discussed with such evidence, evident excitement and delight, or with such intelligence. We recognize in the process of Portnoy's confession things about ourselves we did not know we knew so well. So it wasn't just that this book was a what they call a, uh, in French a success de scandal, a, a, a success because it's a scandal. It was seen at the time to have literary merit, and it was seen to speak for people, to speak for people who themselves felt repressed, whether you know both within and without the Jewish American community. Uh, people felt that there was a, a weight of the old order repressing their urges, repressing their desires. And this book spoke against that. And we can see then that this is related to the poetry that we were reading in the last lecture of the social movements of the 60s, everyone trying to cast off these restraints of an old order. So Roth becomes not just a, 
uh, celebrated writer, which he was when his first book, Goodbye Columbus, was published in 1959. But with Portnoy's complaint, he becomes a celebrity. He becomes somebody that people on the street know about. Um, even if they're like, oh, he wrote that dirty book, he's disgusting. Like that, you know, that, that might have been an opinion on the street, but they knew who he was. So after that, he still has a very long career and he reinvents himself a number of times through his career. So he has this first book, Goodbye Columbus, that's controversial within the Jewish American community, but it establishes him as a literary figure. Then he has Portnoy's Complaint, this famously dirty book in 1969 that makes him a celebrity. And then he struggles with that for about 10 years. And then the Ghost Writer is his next reinvention of himself because it's in the Ghost Writer that he begins writing about Nathan Zuckerman. Nathan Zuckerman is his alter ego, his stand-in, this thinly veiled autobiographical uh, person through whom Roth can now fully discuss his early life. And then in the books after The Ghost Rider, Nathan Zuckerman publishes a book like Portnoy's Complaint, and it's it through Zuckerman that Roth discusses what this celebrity did to his life. And then he reinvents himself in the 90s because Nathan Zuckerman begins telling the stories of other people he knows in a series of works called the American Trilogy from 1997 to 2000, in which Zuckerman, instead of, because the charge against Roth about the book coming from the ghostwriter about Zuckerman was he was narcissistic. He's only writing about himself. He only cares about himself. And so Zuckerman, his autobiographical character in the books of the American Trilogy, begins writing about the stories of other people that are symbolic of the changes in American life that have been happening in the 20th century. So the first book of the American Trilogy is about the protests of the 1960s. The second book is about McCarthyism. The third book is about the Clinton impeachment and the atmosphere around that in the 90s. And it's with the American Trilogy that Roth becomes... So he'd been a respected writer among writers. He'd been controversial within the Jewish American community. Then he was broadly controversial and even notorious because of Portnoy's complaint. But in the late 90s, he becomes a generally respected and beloved writer because of the American trilogy. And so I think my two pictures on this slide are indicative of these two Roths. The Roth who's, you know, pointing at you, joking with you, laughing at you, trying to provoke you, trying to confront you, trying to shock you. Because let's be clear, in a lot of his work, he was trying to be controversial. He was trying to provoke, to shock, to offend, because he thought that was part of the writer's mission, that he thought that was how you got rid of the repression that bore down on people in society. You had to point, you had to prod, you had to provoke. He wanted, in some ways, to be hated, I think. He wanted to be controversial. He thought it was a sign that he was doing what he had to do as a writer. And yet, by the end of his life, um, he had become an institution, a revered figure. And that's my second image, where uh, Barack Obama awarded him in, um, I didn't not note the year, sometime I think in like, let's say 2010 or 2011 or so, Barack Obama awarded him, I think, one of the uh, presidential medals of the arts and, you know, put this medal on him. And Barack Obama, in fact, who was a very literary uh, guy, had said that Roth's work was something he loved when he was young because he thought that the way Roth wrote about his struggle with his identity as a Jewish American uh, resonated with Barack Obama and the way he felt that he str had struggled with his identity as a young African American. So Obama was a big fan of Roth, and so he he sort of honored him. Though you might be wondering about the you know the politics of it. One of the things about Roth is he was attacked from all sides politically throughout his life because the political right thought he was obscene and thought he was sort of degrading art and literature with his um, with his uh, supposed obscenity. But the left also didn't like him either because he, because particularly the feminist left, because he wrote unapologetically about sex from a male point of view, a heterosexual male's point of view. And as you can see in The Ghost Rider, he did not, um, he didn't uh, evade the 
the objectifying of women, the the appetite, you know, toward women that was that was often, um, you know, not in line with feminism, and so he was often attacked on that basis for his work. Uh, though he's had defenders on that basis too. Uh, it's a it's a tough question, and we're not going to be able to settle it through reading the Ghostwriter because that's not mainly what the Ghostwriter is about. I think one thing I would say about that though is that. Um, one of the, the, the critiques that feminism always made of the male writer, you know, uh, considered in general, was that the male writer passed off the male point of view when writing about women as if it were universal. And it sort of claimed the right for men to speak for women. And I think that was very much true of, you know, a lot of older novelists, uh, you know, classic European novelists. They often wrote about women as if they they understood everything about women and they could have the last word and so they passed off a male perspective as a universal one and passed off their often their sexist writing as the universal truth i think roth never did that i think roth's work always comes from a clear point of view a clear place it never pretends to be the universal it's always coming from this man in this man's body, in this man's position. And so in that sense, this will sound a little bit perverse to say, but I think Roth's books could only have been written, you know, in, you know, contemporaneously with feminism. His books um, are in a way cognizant of the feminist critique, uh, but that doesn't mean that the content in them isn't, isn't sexist. So I want to flag those issues. Um, and, uh, but like I said, it's not, I don't think it's, it's in the ghostwriter that we really find that topic uh, addressed. You'd have to look at some of his other works to see if you agree with the feminist critique or with, in fact, the feminist defenders, which Roth has. So, uh, so I don't know. Um, but like I said, by the end of his life, he was still, you know, considered somewhat controversial. But by the end of his life, he, he was a fairly respected writer. So what is the ghostwriter about? Why do I want to talk about the ghostwriter in particular in a class called Introduction to Multicultural Literatures? I want to talk about it because I, I think that it's probably one of the best books that I'm aware of that's about something I mentioned in the course description on the syllabus, which is this, the, the following issue. What is the responsibility of a writer who belongs to a community that has been marginalized or oppressed toward that community, and particularly in the writing. Does a writer who belongs to a community that's been marginalized or oppressed have an obligation to write against that oppression, to write about that community, to be a representative of that community, to be a positive representative of that community, to mainly write positive things about that community in order to contest the way in which they have been marginalized or oppressed? Or does the writer, uh, should the writer just be pledged to tell the truth about that community and represent it in all of its um, complexity? Because I, I assume we all agree that every community has um, has flaws as well that could be represented in literature. So that to me is the main thing the ghostwriter is about. If you want like if you want a big uh, high level summary of why I think it's an interesting book because it's a sustained inquiry into that question. It's about a young writer who is a Jewish American writer in the middle of the 20th century just a decade after the Holocaust in, a, in an American society that's still very much, um, you know, under the, the, I would say, the dominance of an Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture that is in many ways highly anti-Semitic. And Roth is asking, what is the writer's responsibility? We've seen other, you know, we've seen other versions of this question before. Um, we saw, for instance, in The Negro Speaks of Rivers, Langston Hughes seeming to identify himself with the history of people of color and of the African diaspora. So he sort of, he writes in an I that is a we, 
I've known rivers all the way back to Mesopotamia, okay? We've seen Amiri Baraka, and I think Baraka, I think one of the things that's interesting about considering Roth and Baraka together is in some ways I think they represent the two extreme positions you could take on this topic. In black art, Baraka is writing, he's saying, I'm going to write purely from this black worldview. Uh, nothing in my work will come from a white worldview. The point of my work isn't to be an individual. Uh, the point, of, though, you know, in many ways he is, but he, you know, he thinks the point of his work is not to be that, but to write from this black world and for this black world. So in black art, we see the question being answered this way. The writer from a marginalized or oppressed community's responsibility is to write from, for, and to it in a way that is um, uh, to become like a warrior on its behalf. Remember Baraka saying, we want assassin poems, poems that kill, you know, kill whom? Kill the enemies of the black community. We want poems, we want literature that is a weapon for that community. Roth, there's gonna be many complications there's going to be many issues. There's going to be many subtleties. But I think Roth is generally, at least in the mind of his reading public, associated with the opposite position. That the writer is an individual first and foremost, and an individual who will tell the truth no matter what, no matter who gets hurt. Um, and that, I think, is why I think there are two writers to look at in in succession because they represent the two views on this topic at, at you know at, at these extremes so but like i said there's going to be a lot of complexity roth does not come by this opinion if we think he comes by it cheaply he doesn't come by it easily he he knows what the counter arguments are and he represents them i think very fairly in the ghost writer so uh what's all that have to do with this slide i've pulled up so i just want to point out that the dilemma Nathan Zuckerman faces in The Ghost Rider is a dilemma Roth faced in his own life. And it is detailed in a kind of little, uh, uh, an autobi or, uh, sorry, a biography of Roth that was written in 2013 called Roth Unbound, a writer in his books by a writer named Claudia Roth Pierpont, who's not related to Philip Roth. Um, in fact, there's a famous joke that she tells about when the night she met him they were at a dinner party and she's you know somebody said this is claudia roth pierpont and he was like roth are we you know and she she was and she and he looked at her and he said this is probably not a funny joke uh in in certain ways but he looked at her and he said did we used to be married um which whatever i don't know people said philip roth was very funny in person i don't know if you think that's funny but anyway they became friends, and she wrote this kind of friendly biography of him. In fact, when I mention um, people who, uh, uh, feminists who defend Roth's work from a feminist perspective, she's among them, and you can find some of that in this book. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm rambling. Uh, let me get to the point. She details the incident in Roth's life that I think gave rise to the ghostwriter. So I'm just going to read this. In 1962, Roth, who was teaching at the University of Iowa, accepted an invitation to speak at Yeshiva University in New York in a symposium titled The Crisis of Conscience in Minority Writers of Fiction. His fellow speakers were Ralph Ellison, whose depiction of Negro family life and invisible man had brought charges of defamation from his own community, and Pietro di Donato, the author of a novel about Italian immigrants, Christ in Concrete, that had been a bestseller in the 30s. But it was clear from the start that Roth was the center of interest. As he describes the event in his autobiographical volume, The Facts, the tone was set by the moderator's opening question, Mr. Roth, would you write the same stories you've written if you were living in Nazi Germany? The prolonged attacks that followed left him in something like a state of shock, barely able to reply coherently to the questions and statements that were hurled at the stage and overcome by the realization that I was not just opposed but hated. In sympathy, Ellison took up his defense. Roth remembers Ellison stating in regard to his own work that he refused to be a cog in the machinery of civil rights. Nevertheless, upon leaving the stage, Roth was surrounded by a still unsated, fish-shaking crowd. He escaped them at last with his wife and his editor, and in the safety of the stage delicatessen over a pastrami sandwich, he vowed, I'll never write about Jews again. 
And he didn't. His next couple books were not focused on Jewish characters, but then in his subsequent career, he did return to Jewish American themes. Um, but the point is, he had written a couple of short stories that depicted what he saw as um, certain flaws within the Jewish American community, and other Jewish Americans attacked him. They said, we are living, we are a minority in this society, we are under threat from prejudice and bigotry and discrimination, and you writing in this way is giving ammunition to our enemies. And that is the dilemma Nathan Zuckerman, who is Roth's autobiographical kind of surrogate, is facing in this novel, in The Ghost Writer. And that's particularly detailed in chapter two, which I want to look at um, in the next lecture. So that's the inciting incident. That's the context in Roth's life. His early fiction that portrayed... Um, you know, certain issues within the Jewish American community that was thought by other Jewish Americans to be a betrayal. And as you can see from this description, that issue was played out in other minority communities, particularly Ralph Ellison, his great novel, Invisible Man, which is, is one of the greatest novels of the 20th century. I'd like to teach it in this course, but it's just, I think, too long. But he took the individualist position as well, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the African American community. Um, at where he, you know, he said that, you know, it's, it's more important to be individualist. One of his famous quotes is the individual is the ultimate minority. Um, but, you know, other writers take a different position. You, your responsibility, if you belong to a marginalized or oppressed community, is to write on its behalf for it and for the purpose of its advancement, not because you think the writer's mission is to promote individuality or tell the truth. So that's what we're dealing with. A couple more things about The Ghost Rider. I do think, like many interesting novels, it's in a series of different genres. It's not simply one genre. So my image there is the uh, first, the cover of the uh, first edition hardcover, which had no, <laughs> no image on the cover. Um, so I want to just give you a, a couple of terms for the genres to which The Ghost Rider belonged. First, and we've heard this word already, is Bildungsroman, a novel of education, growth, and formation. And how do we know this is a Bildungsroman? Because it pretty much says so on the first page. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the opening uh, paragraph in which Nathan writes about wanting to write a Bildungsroman. But it's also more specifically, and you know, we covered the Bildungsroman when we talked about quicksand, so I'm just going to pass over that quickly. It's a coming-of-age novel. But it's also more specifically than that, there's another long German word, which is Kunstlerroman. I think I'm not a good Germanist, but I think it's Kunstlerroman, which is an artist's Bildungsroman, a novel about an artist's education, growth, and formation, how an artist, you know, including writers, come to be an artist. And it alludes in several passages to other Kunstler romans to prior artists buildings roman any buildings romani the plural of buildings roman it alludes to prior ones and we're gonna you know we're gonna look at some of those allusions and i'm going to explain to you specifically what roth is referring to it's also an autobiographical novel. Now remember, by the time Roth is writing this in 1979, he's a literary celebrity. He's even more than that, he's kind of a general celebrity. So when people pick up this book and read it, they're noticing all the parallels to his own life, which have been written about in magazine profiles, have been shown in television interviews, have been talked about in gossip columns they know that he's writing about his own life his readers by the time they read it and so the point of, you know any novel can be autobiographical i'm sure there's autobiographical elements in both quicksand and the martyred but the audience wouldn't necessarily know that because richard e kim and nella larson weren't celebrities when those books were published roth was so the audience knows it's autobiographical, knows it's more than fiction. And there's a teasing quality because he changes some details. Um, for instance, Nathan's father is a podiatrist, whereas Roth's father was a, uh, 
I'm blanking on what he was. I don't even think it was it was in the medical profession though. So he changes the profession of the father, for instance, but keeps the general you know class status and issues about about it. So it's autobiographical. It's also more than autobiographical. It's a and now we must go from German to French. It's a Romana clay, which is that literally means a novel with a key which means that the characters in it stand in for real, usually well-known people. So it's not just that this is an autobiographical novel about experiences Roth might have had. It's that the other characters are also people that the audience would know about in real life. They're just under sort of false names in the novel. And in particular, the character of E.I. Lonoff and the character of Felix Abravanel are based on other famous Jewish American writers, as I'll detail in the next slide. So Roth is not only toying with readers' awareness of his own life, he's toying with readers' awareness of Jewish American literature, who its main figures are, and how Roth might have known them. Finally, my last two uh, points here on the slide, it's the beginning of a sequence of novels about Nathan Zuckerman. I think all in all there ended up being, let's see, eight or nine. And when you have a series of novels like that, the French have a beautiful phrase. Uh, I, I just put it on here for the sake of the beauty of the phrase. A roman fleuve, or a river novel. And why is it called a river novel? Because it, you know, it's a series of novels where the narrative flows from book to book. So it goes from the ghostwriter to the next book, which I think is Zuckerman Bound, to the next book, which I think is The Anatomy Lesson, and so on. So I, I, just, I just like the phrase, roman fleuve. You should work that into your everyday conversation. And then finally, it's a work of metafiction. This is a novel of the postmodern moment in literature, and one of the key aspects of postmodernism in literature is metafiction, a work of fiction that clearly reminds you that it's fiction. How does the ghostwriter do that? Well, it's a it's a book it's a novel about a novelist. It's a novel about two novelists. It's a novel about how novels are written. It's fiction about how fiction is written. It's fiction about the role of the fiction writer in society, and it's full of references to you know, its own status as a Bildungsroman, its own status as a work of fiction. So it's a metafictional work, and we want to get into some of the details of that too um, as we look at some of the passages. One more thing before we get into it. I don't really want to dwell on this because it doesn't matter if you're not... Um, I don't think appreciating this book hinges on knowing what I'm about to tell you, but I think it's worth knowing. And what's worth knowing is, as I mentioned, this novel is a Romana clay. That is a novel with a key, a novel where the characters are thinly veiled portraits of other famous people. So I mentioned that E.I. Lonoff and Felix Abravanel, who are the two um, older Jewish American writers that Nathan Zuckerman looks up to as mentors, are based on other famous Jewish American writers. And it's not that simple. It's not that, you know, uh, Lanoff represents one famous Jewish American writer and Abravanel represents another. They're each kind of combinations of two. But what I think Roth is trying to do is suggest that in the older generation of Jewish American writers, there had been these two types of writers. There had been these two paths you could take. You could do the you could do one thing um, which is represented by Lanoff and you could do another thing which is represented by Abravanel. And Roth is trying to, you know, he's writing about how when he was starting out as a young writer, he needed to find his place. He needed to find what he would do given these two options. So Lanoff is at, so I quoted a critic off on the side of this slide on the right side where Lanoff is a combination of Bernard Malamud and I.B. Singer, Isaac Bashevis Singer. These were two Jewish American writers who mainly wrote short stories and, you know, short, very compact novels 
that were based on um, Jewish American life in its relation to Jewish life in Europe and the older kind of communities, often very small communities of these small Jewish communities in the shtetl of, uh, of Central and Eastern Europe. And they were, ba they were sort of sad, quiet, lyrical stories of um, small Jewish communities and within them, you know, people who are kind of like uh, uh, sadly, wistfully defeated by life. So that's what Lanoff represents, that one path, writing about Jewish life in this sort of downbeat tone, in this lyrical tone, in this way that focuses on its connection with the kind of village life of Central and Eastern Europe. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, a bravenal is based on a combination of Saul Bellow and Norman Mailer. And these were two writers who sort of preceded Roth in celebrity, particularly Norman Mailer. He's pictured there on my slide, arm wrestling with Muhammad Ali. Um, these two men wrote enormous, exuberant novels that were about the kind of chaos of American life, often not even particularly focusing on Jewish American experience or sort of including that within a bigger panorama. Unlike Malamud and Singer, their work didn't look to the past. It didn't look to Europe necessarily. It was focused on the chaos, the exuberance, the diversity, the plurality, the scandal, of American life. And their, their works also preceded uh, Roth, particularly in Mailer's case of being controversially, uh, uh, quote unquote, obscene, dealing frankly with sex and being, you know, kind of egotistical. They often wrote characters who were stand-ins for themselves. That's why when um, Lanoff is talking about Abravanel, who's the writer that Nathan first seeks out for mentorship before going to Lanoff, he says it's no picnic up there in the ego sphere because they were considered um, egotistical writers, writers who were very focused on the self. So that is another important context for the ghost writer. Roth, looking back at his own, you know, starting out in literature and seeing these two paths before him, would he be a Lanoff or an Abravanel? Would he be a Malamud Singer writer? Would he be a Mailer Bellow writer? So again, that's that part, that's that meta fiction of this novel. It's not just a, it's not just um, an example of Jewish American literature. It's a reflection on Jewish American literature, its history, its possibilities, its writers. But as I said, I think you can enjoy this book without necessarily knowing that, you know, knowing about Malamud, Singer, Mailer, and Bellow. I don't think you have to know who they are to get what's being said. But I, I do think it's part of the way people, you know, reading this book in 1979, when I think every writer pictured here was still alive, was still writing, was still famous, would have picked up on that. And that's signaled by, you know, I quoted from John Leonard's review of this novel from 1979, and he picks up on it right away. And I think a lot of the early readers would have, but it's not necessary. All right, now I want to begin a discussion of the novel itself. I wanna look at a couple of passages um, and, you know, as I normally do, and see what themes they raise. So I think I'm gonna lecture for about, I think 10 more minutes. So I think I'll look at at least the opening of the novel and then we will get into some of the other passages and we'll see how much time we have, and then I'll conclude um, in the next lecture. So as I often do, I kind of want to look at how the book just begins. I just want to read the whole first paragraph, and then I will make some comments on it. So I'm just going to read it, and then we'll see, we'll see what we think. It was the last daylight hour of a December afternoon more than 20 years ago. I was 23, writing and publishing my first short stories, and like many a Bildungsroman hero before me, already contemplating my own massive Bildungsroman, when I arrived at his hideaway to meet the great man. The clappered farmhouse was at the end of an unpaved road 1,200 feet up in the Berkshires, yet the figure who emerged from the study to bestow a ceremonious greeting 
wore a gabardine suit, a knitted blue tie clipped to a white shirt by an unadorned silver clasp, and well-brushed ministerial black shoes that made me think of him stepping down from a shoeshine stand rather than from the high altar of art. Before I had composure enough to notice the commanding autocratic angle at which he held his chin, or the regal, meticulous, rather dainty care he took to arrange his clothes before sitting, to notice anything really other than that I had miraculously made it from my unliterary origins to here, to him. My impression was that E.I. Lanoff looked more like the local superintendent of schools than the region's most original storyteller since Melville and Hawthorne. So I want to point out a few things in this passage. So first of all, we're given, we're given the setting right away. It's uh, December at a farmhouse in the Berkshires. So the Berkshires are a kind of rural community in Western Massachusetts. And the Berkshires have a pretty famous history in classic American literature because, as you note at the end of this paragraph, Nathaniel Hawthorne and Herman Melville both lived there for a time. And they were two of the major American writers of the 19th century, two of the major writers that put American literature when the country was still young on the map of world literature. So when, when you know, Lanoff, by living there, is, I think, claiming a place in that lineage of American literature. Now, what's interesting is that Melville and Hawthorne both in different ways represent that um, white Anglo-Saxon, maybe not in Melville's case, I think he was Dutch, but that, let's just say, white Protestant dominance of American literature. They both represent that white Protestant tradition that sort of, you know, claimed as its own the territory of New England was very much identified with the countryside of New England. Whereas, um, and I think this is raised in a poem we didn't get to discuss, but which I asked you to read, which is Gerald Stern's Behaving Like a Jew. In the Jewish American tradition, it tended because it was an immigrant tradition and immigrants of all backgrounds tended to enter the United States through America's cities. It tended to be an urban phenomenon. Um, and so claiming that's why in the opening pages of the ghostwriter, when Zuckerman is talking about what New York editors and New York writers say about Lanoff, they're sort of laughing about, oh, what's he doing up there in the countryside? What's he doing up there um, in, you know, in rural New England, as if that were a strange place for a Jewish American person to be? I think it comes from that idea. Uh, and again, I don't think it's just limited to, to Jewish American people, but to people of immigrant backgrounds, that being of an immigrant background, that's an urban thing. You come in, you enter through the cities, you live in the city, and the rural, the countryside, that belongs to, you know, again, this white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, uh, at least in the north, where, you know, it might belong to whatever, if we want to get into the, the regional ethnicities of America, the Scots-Irish or something in the south, but in the north, that white Anglo-Saxon dominance. So in that sense, the setting has this, the setting asks us this question which is the following. If you are a member of somebody of a group that's outside of that white Anglo-Saxon Protestant dominance of literature, can you just step into the tradition? Can you just consider yourself a descendant of Melville and Hawthorne? Or do you have to make some critique of that canon that had been exclusive? And we've seen different positions on this throughout our course already. We saw for instance, writing from the stand from a kind of feminist standpoint, we saw Muriel Ruckheiser, no more mythology. She's going to reject that tradition, that tradition, that dominant, in her case, the dominant male tradition was oppressive to her to write as a woman. She had to reject it. We saw, by contrast, uh, Robert Hayden writing from an African-American position, um, quoting from, adopting, bringing into his own work in, I think, a way meant to signal its universality, quotations from Shakespeare, from T.S. Eliot, from Samuel Taylor Coleridge, from that white European or Euro-American canon. 
So again, in each case, whether you're talking about feminism, whether you're talking about African American writing, Jewish American writing, it's it's you know there's particulars to each case, but there's a general question I think being raised when we look across these multicultural literatures, which is, can a writer who belongs to a marginalized or oppressed group um, just adopt the literary tradition that had excluded them? and you know make an assertion that well my work is universal that work is universal uh or does the writer have to reject that prior tradition and i think when lanoff sort of steps into the place occupied literally by melville and hawthorne steps into their region that's the question being asked there um so that's number one that's the first thing i want to point out about this passage is the significance of the setting um, and also its position, this is a novel written in 1979, but it's set 20 years before. So it's a novel set in the 1950s. Uh, so it's set in that moment of sober, disillusioned, tragic realism, and Roth knows it. Uh, Roth is going to signal how, how different the, 60, the 50s were from the 60s, from what followed uh, in later passages. So next thing I want to note is Nathan Zuckerman uh, refers to himself, uh, you know, this might be what somebody might call a little too on the nose, he refers to himself as a Bildungsroman hero. So this is a meta Bildungsroman. This is a coming-of-age story about coming-of-age stories. It's a coming-of-age story that knows it's a coming-of-age story. So it's constantly um, asking us to ask what kind of buildings Roman is this? What does it have to do with other kinds of coming of age stories? What is its relation to the literary tradition? That's uh, the second thing I want to point out about this passage. And the third thing I want to point out about this passage is this. If there's a central theme in Roth's work that isn't just about you know, the two things that his work is often said to be about are about male sexuality, heterosexual male sexuality, and the Jewish American experience, and often these two things in concert. But if I were to zoom even further out and give you a big philosophical thing that Roth is concerned with, it's again that question of, you know, what controls life? Is it high ideals? Is it noble ideals? Or is life controlled by baser desires, desires whether for sex, which he writes about a lot, or for other things, power, money, fame, renown. And the movement in this paragraph is a de-idealizing one. And there's a constant, I think, de-idealizing throughout the novel as throughout Roth's work. He's always showing you that seemingly noble ideals rest on the very shaky foundations of the realities of the human body, the realities of human appetites and needs. And we see that when Lanoff, because Zuckerman goes to Lanoff hoping to find somebody from the high altar of art, this kind of priest of art. And you'll note there's a kind of persistent um, Christian language around the idealism of art. And yet what he finds is something much more mundane throughout this novel. He says, I thought he was going to step down from the high altar of art, but he looked more like he was stepping down from a shoe shine stand. And he looks more like the local superintendent of schools than like some great author. But I think the point of this book, the point this book, uh, one of the many points this book is going to make in its metafictional reflection on literature is that any author is you know stepping down from the shoe shine stand and just looks like a local any author is just a person it's just a human being with human needs and human desires and human appetites and the idealism of art and as i think we'll get into in the next lecture other kinds of idealism are false uh and they're they're false idols that need to be smashed so that you can see the re the human base reality beneath them. So how is that going to play itself out in the rest of the book? Um, I think I've been talking for about an hour. So I'm going to end it here with my reflection on the opening paragraph. And then I want to focus 
um, on a few more passages from the first uh, section where uh, Nathan is talking about his desire for Lanoff to be his sort of spiritual father. We need to understand what that's all about, and we need to understand how this book is positioning itself in relation to prior works of literature, both um, Jewish, Jewish American, Jewish European, European. It's positioning itself in a, in a kind of world history of literature, so we need to look at that. And then I want to get into the issues of the Jewish American writers' responsibilities when faced with anti-Semitism, and then how that plays out. I, I don't expect you to have finished the novel by then, so there's a, uh, a very strange and shocking twist in the third chapter. Uh, if you haven't read it, let me say that to kind of entice you to finish reading it. And that's the thing this book is known for, is the sort of shocking uh, transition in the third chapter. And I'm not going to spoil it for you, but it's going to open a whole other series of issues that we're going to need to confront. So for, you know, before the next lecture, please finish reading the book, and then I will uh, conclude my discussion of Roth's The Ghostwriter. In the meantime, thanks very much, and have a great day.